So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nangulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Policies can either make or break a country and its people. Hence, they should be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247 in 2002, the government declared the month of September as Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness on the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and research use among decision makers and raise the public's literacy on socioeconomic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRM. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by PIDS and its partners to celebrate the DPRM. Every year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme, which is usually a current or an emerging development issue of national significance. For instance, the DPRM has centered on issues pertaining to regulations, 
risk reduction and management, decentralization, the fourth industrial revolution, and the new globalization. This year, in response to what is happening globally and locally, the DPRM is focusing on the theme, bouncing back together, innovating governance for the new normal. Through this theme, we hope to help in channeling our collective resolve as a nation toward moving forward from the adverse impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. For us to bounce back from this crisis, we must innovate governance across all sectors of society to steer the country toward the path of renewed growth and dynamism. A whole of society approach is crucial with the government taking the lead and engaging all stakeholders, including the private sector, academia, civil society, and local communities to innovate and reconfigure their strategies, structures, and processes. To adapt to the new normal, which entails a new way of working, learning, and interacting with one another, public and private sectors need to invest in digital education, e-commerce, e-finance, e-health, and other innovative ways of delivering services. At the same time, the government should ramp up its social protection system to assist the most vulnerable sectors seriously affected by increasing unemployment and loss of income. As individual citizens, we also have a role to play in helping the country bounce back in the new normal. We should be innovative, adaptive, and agile in the face of adversity and change. By shifting to a new brand of governance that is agile and innovative, we can beat this crisis. Visit the DPRM website for more information. Oh, my test. Hello, my test. Good morning, Mahar. This is Celia. Um, let me just ask our staff to. Um, to check. Hirap naman pasukin itong WebEx events na to, but hindi WebEx meetings na lang. Madaming participants. Ganun ba? <laughs> okay. Sige. Hanapin ko lang yung... Unmute na ako muna, ha? Yes. All right.
good morning everyone so while waiting um maybe draw your attention to the house rules which are flashed on the screen we will start at exactly nine o'clock so i'll uh, see you in three minutes thank you Good morning, everyone. I'm Sheila Sierra of PIDS, and I will be moderating this webinar. Before we begin, may I have your attention regarding our house rules? So for all attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry, and this is to prevent any background noise. But this doesn't mean that you cannot join the discussion. So uh, to participate in the open forum, just uh, use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of your screen. Just type your name your affiliation and your question and send it to all panelists. I repeat, all panelists, not to a particular person. I will read your question during the open forum. And uh, for uh, those of you who are watching us on Facebook, you are also very much welcome to participate in the discussion. Just type your question in the comment section and I will read up to two questions during the open forum. And since we have limited time, please make your questions concise. Okay, so let us begin. Again, welcome everyone. This is the last of our four-part webinar series for the sixth annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC, which is the main and culminating activity of the Development Policy Research Month. So our first webinar touched on broad prescriptions on how to reconfigure or reshape our response to the pandemic to achieve better results and thrive in the new normal. Then in our second webinar, we talk about institutional reforms we we'll look at the policy and regulatory environment, particularly the needed uh, changes and improvements in our formal or informal rules and regulations to accelerate transformations. Then last Tuesday, we tackled another 
essential aspect of governance innovation, which is reforming the human resource, or more specifically, the civil service, which is inarguably the most important asset of the government. So having looked at the policy and regulatory environment and the human resource component in our previous webinars, our focus this morning is on technology, which we call smart systems or smart solutions. And this morning, we'll hear from our resource speakers some practical applications of new technologies in socioeconomic data analytics, disaster risk reduction and management, and financial services. And through this webinar, we hope to draw insights on how developing countries like the Philippines can adopt and sustain the implementation of smart systems in governance to achieve resilience and agility in these turbulent times. So to formally open our event, may I call on the president of PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Ma'am Cel? officials who are with us this morning. Uh, we have um, DBM Undersecretary Laura Pasqua and Assistant Secretary Kim Robert de Leon. From DA, we have Undersecretary Rodolfo Vicera and Assistant Secretary Lere Panes. From DAR, we have Undersecretary Virginia Orogo. From the ILG, Assistant Secretary Francisco Cruz. From NEDA, we have Assistant Secretaries Roderick Planta and Greg Pineda and Regional Directors Roan Bacal and Susan Sumbiling. From DOT, we have Assistant Secretaries Verna Esmeralda Buensuceso and Maria Rica Bueno. From DFA, Acting Assistant Secretary Jesusa Susana Paez. And from the Office of the Cabinet Secretariat, we have Undersecretary Joan Burgos and Assistant Secretaries Ricky De La Torre and Jose Silton Solidum. Um, from the OST, we're joined this morning uh, by PCHRD Executive Director Jaime Montoya and uh, the OST Regional Directors Alexander Madrigal and Jose Patalinghu. Uh, from NCDA, we have Executive Director Emerito Rojas, and we're also joined this morning by directors and other officials from the Department of Finance, DA Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, Senate Economic Planning Office, DOLE, Institute for Labor Studies, DFA, the ICT, the OST, DTI, the SWD, the OTR, PPP, NEDA, BOI, BIR, DOE, Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines, National Water Resources, Securities and Exchange Commission, and Agricultural Credit um, Policy. Um, we also have um, today representatives from many local government units led by Quirino Governor Daquila Carlos Cua and Quezon City Mayor Maria Josefina Belmonte. And from the academy, we have um, from the Cebu National University, President Filomena Dayagbil and Vice President Floriza Laplap. From Southern Luzon State University, we have President Dorasi Zoleta Nantes and Vice President Marisa Esperal. And from Bampanga State Uni Agricultural University, we have Vice President um, Anita David and Vice President Lyndon Solis. Um, from the University of Rizal System, Vice President for Research Development Extension and Production, Marites Rio, and UP Executive Vice President Teodoro Urbosa. And to all directors of schools and colleges uh, present in this uh, webinar. We also have this morning, um, Canadian Ambassador Peter MacArthur, Indonesian First Secretary Nugraha Baskoro Adji, and Unido Country Representative Tony Lin Lim. And of course, as usual, we have the support of members of our Board of Trustee, uh, led by Dr. Gilbert Tianto and Board Advisor Dr. Alfredo Pascual and former PIDS Board of Trustee and CIRCA Senior Fellow William Padolina. So colleagues from the government and representatives from the academe um, civil society and the private sector, as well as viewers from our Facebook page. Good morning to all of you and welcome to the last of the four-part webinar series of this year's annual public policy conference, focusing on governance innovations. For the past three webinars, we focus on the various aspects of improving governance. We look into reforms and innovations and um, best practices in other countries on strengthening the capacities of the public sector. All of these are in line to help our government um, be truly responsive and capable of keeping up with rapid developments and dealing with future shocks. With technological developments changing the way we live and work, it is essential for us, especially the government, to embrace 
um, new technologies and dig digital systems to make public service delivery more efficient and effective. Other countries have also successfully developed their models of e-government or the use of information and communication technology across the public sector. The DPRM concept paper written by, by our APPC technical committee and published as a PIDS discussion paper looked into the best practices of Canada and Estonia, two of the most elaborate and successful models in terms of providing seamless government services. Canada, through the Service Canada, was able to develop a single point of access to federal government services and benefits through the internet, telephone, and mail. This includes employment insurance claims, child benefit claims, among others. More importantly, they were able to bring this service throughout their country, including their rural areas. This is also the case in Estonia, where access to the internet or mobile phones was limited two decades ago. With their leaders deciding to invest heavily in IT infrastructures, they were able to develop the use of ICT in accessing government um, services, including e-voting, e-taxes, e-police, e-healthcare, e-notary, e-banking, e-school, and many more. It should be our goal to be like Estonia or Canada in terms of utilizing smart systems. However, we need to improve our citizens' digital access and beef up our digital infrastructure. In one of our webinars, Director Teresa Garcia of the Department of Information and Communications Technology reported the findings of the 2019 National ICT Household Survey conducted by the department in partnership with the Philippine Statistical Research and Training Institute. The survey found that the majority or 84% of the surveyed households do not have access to the internet, the highest being in BARM and Region 5. At the community level, the survey found that 64% of barangays interviewed do not have telecommunication towers in their areas, 70% do not have fiber optic cables installed in their communities, and 88% do not have free Wi-Fi. Um, in line with this, the government is pouring in resources to fully harness the potentials of e-government, which is key to improving public governance. The government, through the DICT, has allocated a total of $21.4 billion under the Medium Term Information and Communications Technology Harmonization Initiative, or METI, for information and communications technology expenditure. This is intended to improve Wi-Fi, broadband infrastructure, and develop an e-platform and online system to support the e-governance initiatives of different government agencies. A digital ID through the national ID system would be an important step towards building smart systems. Together with a community-based monitoring system, the two systems would generate more disaggregated information that will allow identification of the poor and vulnerable. And with digital payment systems, these systems will allow for quicker response to the pandemic and other risks. Assistance programs such as the social amelioration program can more easily be distributed. Data and systems from other agencies can build on this, but this would require interoperable systems. As early as now, guidelines have to be established to ensure that the numerous information systems can be easily merged and processed to allow us to provide better information, respond more quickly, and monitor the implementation and effectiveness of our interventions. We hope that through these initiatives, the government will be able to improve its services and respond better to the needs of the people. This morning, we will hear from our speakers how we can use technology to provide better services to our people. I want to thank our speakers, Ms. Stephanie C., Dr. Mahar Lagmay, and Director Laura Ignacio for accepting our invitation to serve as resource persons in today's webinar. They will be sharing various technological innovations in poverty mapping, payment system, and disaster preparedness. I would like to thank in particular the PIDS APPC Committee, led by Dr. Marife Balisteros, with Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, Dr. Justin Sika, Dr. Sunny Domingo, and Dr. Valerie Gilbert Ulep, who put together this four-part webinar series on governance innovations, and to the team of Dr. Sheila CR for hosting the webinars. I'd also like to acknowledge our partner for this webinar series, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Thanks also to the government agencies who form part of our DPM steering committee. And finally, I would like to thank you all for your participation. Before I end, I'd like to invite you to watch this video, which summarizes the message of this year's Development Policy Research Month celebration. Thank you.
2020 was supposed to usher in new beginnings and signify renewed hopes and recharged potentials. But as the Philippines navigated the first quarter, a series of unfortunate events began to unravel. The Taal volcanic eruption, the earthquakes in Mindanao, and a deadly virus spreading worldwide, affecting mostly older people and those with compromised immune systems, hospitalizing the infected, paralyzing jobs, and placing the economy at a standstill. It happened gradually, then suddenly, it became out of hand. The COVID-19 has plunged the Philippines and the world into a crisis like no other. Now we find ourselves home quarantined and socially distanced. And as the pandemic continues to push the world from behind, people ploddingly enter the new normal lost and terrified. With the Philippines' future still uncertain, it is essential to know the serious impediments that slow the country from beating the novel coronavirus and from moving forward from the adverse effects of the socio-economic crisis so we can come up with solutions to help the country get back on its feet. The pandemic has exposed the weaknesses of our governance system, such as the lack of effective coordination between and among government units the absence of clear protocols or manual of operations on managing health emergencies, outdated and fragmented information systems, lack of shared standards and interoperability, lack of reliable tools for targeting beneficiaries of social assistance programs, and an ill-equipped workforce at various levels of local administration. Our government is presented with the challenge of reviving the economy under the new normal and the perennial threat of pandemics, climate change, food insecurity, and fiscal crises. Meanwhile, the business sector needs to reshape itself to thrive in a more uncertain and competitive environment. The academe is left to look for more innovative approaches to sustain education delivery in the new normal and to keep up with the fourth industrial revolution. And there's a troubling rise of public discontent due to limited resources and mobility and increasing joblessness and poverty. The coronavirus pandemic and other risk factors threaten our sustained economic progress and attainment of sustainable development. To move forward and recover from this crisis and face other challenges, we need to innovate governance across all sectors of society to steer the country toward new growth and dynamism. We must, more than ever, work together as one nation to defeat this pandemic. This fight can be won with the concerted effort of all sectors of society. We can treat this pandemic as an opportunity to establish an innovative and agile governance system capable of managing risks and crises. The government should take the lead in creating an environment conducive to learning and innovation by addressing institutional coordination and infrastructural issues. It should strengthen the capacities of the civil service through continuous professional development and by establishing a reward and incentive system that emphasizes productivity and innovation. Government offices should develop smart systems to hasten the delivery of public services. To boost the country's resilience to risks and disasters, continuous human capital formation is a must. There should be more efficient access to healthcare services, broad-based access to quality education, and more effective social protection systems. Public and private sector agencies should update and foster interconnection and integration of information systems, promote data sharing and digitalization, and work together toward the advancement of the IT infrastructure. In aiming for organizational agility, the business sector must revisit and redefine their strategies and strive for survivability and resilience. The academe should be ready to provide flexible learning options for students to continue their education. To prepare young people for jobs of the future, 
The curriculum should include both cognitive and socio-emotional development and should be responsive to the needs of industry. Civil society organizations should also innovate their strategies and processes to better reach sectors that have limited access to government channels. The general public also plays a key role in helping the country bounce back in the new normal. Citizens must be open to new ways of doing things. They should be adaptive and innovative in the face of adversity and change. They should retool and retrain by taking advantage of free learning opportunities. They must have an entrepreneurial mindset to thrive amid loss of income and rising unemployment. Despite the devastation that we are facing, we need to have faith that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and this shall soon pass. We should continue to focus our energies on mitigating the spread of the virus, on saving the economy from the damage caused by the pandemic, and on assisting affected sectors in coping with this crisis. Every September, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies leads the entire nation in celebrating the Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM, to emphasize the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policy interventions to current and emerging development concerns. This year, we chose Innovating Governance for the New Normal as the theme of the 2020 DPRM to rouse our collective consciousness as a nation toward one goal, to bounce back from this crisis by improving the way we govern ourselves and our country. The DPRM's main and culminating activity is the Annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC, which convenes and engages policymakers and analysts, social scientists, and representatives from the government, private sector, and civil society in a rational and evidence-based discussion of issues, opportunities, and policy options. With this year's DPRM celebration, we hope to encourage our fellow civil servants and other development actors and stakeholders to be innovative and agile to help our country move forward from this pandemic. Together, we can bounce back stronger in the new normal. Thank you very much, uh, Mamsel. So I think we are ready to listen to the, to the presentations. But before we start, allow me to um, remind our speakers about the time allocation. So it's 25 minutes per speaker, and we will play alert tones at five minutes before your time is up and when you have already consumed uh, the time allotted to your presentation. OK. So um, we will have a slight change in the order of um, our presentations because our first speaker is not yet in. So if I may call on Dr. Mahar Lagmai first. Um, Dr. Lagmai? Okay, but first um, let me say something about him. So our first speaker for our um, uh, first presentation, we will see the application of smart systems in disaster risk reduction and management, which is uh, a critical area for the Philippines, considering that we are one of the most disaster prone countries in the world. The, uh, the Philippines is ranked third in the 2018 World Risk Index, and things have become more complicated because of this pandemic. Our speaker is synonymous with uh, Project NOAA, which has contributed significantly to effective disaster risk reduction and management in the country, thanks to his leadership. He is an academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology and a professor of the National Institute of Geological Sciences at the University of the Philippines. And currently, he is the executive director of the UP Resilience in Institute and the director of the UP Na Nationwide Operational Assessment 
of Hazard's Center. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of the Philippines and holds a PhD in Earth Sciences from the University of Cambridge. He is also a leading international scientific expert on natural hazards. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Alfredo Mahar Francisco Lagmay. Dr. Lagmay? Thank you very much, Sheila, for the introduction. Uh, if everybody can hear me, is my audio all right? Okay, thumbs up. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to share the presentation that I have for today in this uh, meeting. Okay. All right. Can the screen be seen? Hello? Sir, we can see your screen. Okay, and the audio is okay, so I can start. I've been asked yes. to present uh, on the topic of smart systems for climate change governance and disaster resiliency, or something to that effect. And I thought it best that I, I present uh, an actual example which the UP Resilience Institute is currently doing. And that uh, uh, project is particularly important because <clears throat> it is being done in the capital city of the Philippines, which is Manila. So everything that we're doing now in that city is or has got something to do with smart systems for climate change and governance and disaster resiliency. The project was approved uh, early this year and it's currently ongoing and it involves a lot of uh, experts from different fields of the University of the Philippines system. The reason why we're doing it because is because of the provision in the in the in, in the in the well general appropriations act uh, uh, in the sense that the UP Resilience Institute is supposed to along with state universities and colleges to support climate change commission in training LGUs to formulate and complete local climate change action plans and comprehensive land use plans and it is also part of the uh, public service duty of the University of the Philippines. We were able to uh, get the LG of Manila to allow us to help them with uh, that kind of project, which involves climate and disaster risk assessment, land use planning, institutional analysis, emergency management using the Internet of Things, and in phase two, we're supposed to do the LDRRMP, the LCCAP, capacity building. Uh, we will be conducting training and simulation exercises. Uh, this one is coming from UP Manila. And also the development of risk communication protocols. Many of these uh, things that we're going to do is derived from the experience of UP, from the various experts uh, from the different constituent units, as well as the experience derived from uh, Project NOAA, which started in 2012 and ended in uh, sometime, uh, I think, uh, early 2017. Now, the Work is also based on the experience of the various experts, not just scientists, not just engineers, but also uh, social scientists uh, as well as artists. And the experience that uh, we have is actual experience uh, in terms of doing the local climate change action plans for Batangas, Science City of Manios, uh, that's Batangas in Taisan, Naga City. There's also Padre Garcia, uh, work done on the comprehensive land use plan, assisting Taisan, Padre Garcia, Science City of Munoz, Makati, uh, and so on and so forth. And also for 
the SIDRA, the Disaster Risk Assessment, may High Laguna, Dumangas, Zaraga, in Iloilo, Pasi, in Iloilo, Tugigaraw City, Igig, in Cagayan, as well as 34 municipalities of Samar and Leyte, which was a project uh, together with the ADB and, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Climate Change Commission. And also of Naga City, Cebu, uh, at this time it was ongoing. I, I believe it's at the, towards the end part. And also doing the LDRRMP uh, for 51 LGUs of Cebu uh, and many others. So basically, we uh, try to gather all of that we can help Manila in constructing their uh, land use plans as well as uh, disaster use assessment and local climate change action plans. We follow certain basic principles in our work to help uh, the LGUs. And these principles, I believe, are uh, contained in the video presentation that was presented uh, before, uh, before uh, this presentation. And I'm happy to see that in the video presentation with particular emphasis on transparency. The basic principles uh, that we follow are that it's supposed to be science-based with climate change projections, participatory, uh, there's supposed to be capacity building. The work is transdisciplinary. Uh, we have a deep pool of experts composed of 200 fellows from different fields of expertise working with the LGU of the city of Manila and uh, the many stakeholders that are involved in the consultations. It's also necessary that uh, the work uh, be sustainable. Uh, we plan to do a platform that is available for use by the city of Manila and makes use of advanced technology that is low cost because uh, Technology has advanced in such a way that uh, many of the parts uh, used to construct uh, instruments are already widely available. And because they are widely available, it has uh, been uh, lowered down in terms of cost for use by many. So that's uh, making use of advanced technologies for uh, the good or for the public. Good. Uh, it's also very important that uh, in, in helping the LGUs or helping Manila that we go beyond the historical worst case scenario. The reason for that is because we're dealing with climate change and many of the projections that are said in uh, discussions on climate change or in the science of climate change, many of them have not happened. Or at least we don't know yet for sure if they have happened, maybe they have. But uh, many of the projections are for the future. And if we are to uh, rely only on the historical record, we will be missing on the very important information from science that will get us to project and prepare or adapt to those future scenarios. On top of that, we have also noticed that whenever there's a disaster, uh, what people always say when there is a survivor is that it's the first time that they've experienced such an event. They've never seen such a big flood that high. They've never seen landslide hap landslides happen in happen in this in their area for so many years. The thing is that if we are not able to anticipate and those accounts of the survivors uh, are actually reflections of the uh, uh, of, of surprise and uh, non anticipation of an event. That means that if we are able to uh, not depict, not able to depict those future bigger events than the historical record or from what people remember, then we will fail to plan. 
what we would like to emphasize is that there should always bigger events than what the people has experienced or remembered. So we have to go beyond the historical record. Especially for climate change, this is very, very important. Now, uh, when we come to climate change scenarios, uh, this is what the uh, image would be. So there are different uh, scenarios of floods. Climate change projections say that the there will be more powerful typhoons and more intense rains. The rain actually is not the hazard. It's the flood that is spawned by the rains that constitute the hazard. So we have to depict that into maps or depict that in maps of various scenarios depending on what climate change scientists are saying. Because if we do not uh, depict that, how can we prepare? we have to be able to prepare for those scenarios, scenarios that we expect to be bigger than what we have experienced. This is just one example. This is a map, a hazard map of landslides and floods depicting the historical record. The yellow represents uh, low susceptibility to flood, uh, to landslides. The green represents moderate susceptibility to floods. The violet color represents uh, high susceptibility to floods, whereas uh, this apple green color represents low susceptibility to floods. This is a historical, this is a map prepared based on the historical records without a uh, basis for uh, climate change projections. If we maintain this kind of uh, hazard maps in planning uh, uh, the SIDRA, the CLUP, or whatever, whatever plans there are for uh, that, that the LGUs wish to create, then we are missing on something. We are missing on the scenarios that are bigger than what people remember. So if they were asked, the people in that community were asked whether it's safe to site an evacuation center there, for example, uh, naturally they would say, oh, yes, it, we do not experience or we have not experienced uh, floods in that area. But the moment that we try to uh, 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 make scenarios of bigger floods, this is what might happen, especially with climate change. Of course, this, the small floods would agree to the, with the accounts of the people in the community. But come the time when there, there are uh, heavier rains and more sustained rains and bigger floods, that would actually affect that evacuation center. And uh, if, a, if there's a bigger flood, that would be the scenario. So what happens is that uh, if you put them all into that evacuation center, just relying on the accounts of the people, then come the time that uh, the climate change projections become true, or come the time that a bigger event uh, happens, bigger than what they know, then all of those people that were put in that evacuation center will die. And if there are survivors, what will they say? When they are interviewed by media, they will say, oh, we were put here and uh, that's the first time that we've experienced this kind of flood. The reason for that is because they have not seen such a flood and most of the disasters that happen based on the accounts of people uh, actually say that uh, we, we failed to anticipate the bigger event than what we have experienced. And that's very important. It's called as anticipatory planning. And we need to emphasize that in planning communities. We have to bring those information down to community level. It's, it's uh, uh, extremely important that the stakeholders be able to understand the science and be able to do the science themselves, or at least understand it when they participate there is uh, what we call as uh, 
there's there's uh, uh, some kind of effect that they they, they 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 have ownership and that ownership uh, makes them believe that what they're doing is uh, the way to do it uh, uh, belief in in some kind of action is very important because if you just re uh, rely on discipline and blame them uh, discipline really is something that you do without belief. So you have to uh, put that or make the people embrace the science, make it part of their culture, so that there's this uh, uh, belief uh, that they, they have in such a way that when they are asked or they need to do a, a responsive action, they, they do it because they know it, they believe it, and they want it. Now, all of those, uh, what do you call this? Oh, all of those planning that needs to be not done should be across all sectors, agriculture, coastal, water, health. Uh, the current pandemic is, is a crisis and uh, that, uh, that could have been planned. There is what we call as complex disasters, wherein a certain type of hazard is compounded by another type of hazard. There are many types of hazards that can make the problem more complex than, uh, than if you are to just uh, work on or solve a, a single type of hazard. It must be also planned uh, in different sectors of society. Uh, different sectors such as forestry, biodiversity, environment, energy, education, tourism, infrastructure, settlement, and mining. And this only goes to show that the expertise that is needed to help an LGU plan needs to be really, really wide. Uh, I can only probably input some stuff there and I will have to rely on many, many, many other experts to do a good job in helping the city of Manila and other LGUs in their planning process. <clears throat> in our past work in Iloilo, we tried to create an online analytics platform and repository for the local climate change action plans and development plans of the community. Uh, it's an online platform uh, that uh, can be expanded. In fact, uh, the DICT, I believe, uh, has this account in this server, so that can be uh, uh, expanded further. Uh, the maps that I was talking to you about are reflected in this server. Uh, it's called the Rebuild Program, funded by the New Zealand Aid with the United Nations and CCC. Now, there are many types of hazards. If you look at the panel, there is a five-year rain return, 25-year, 100-year uh, return for the year 2017. And we're looking also at the representative concentration pathways as suggested by the IPCC for the years 2049 and 2079. So each of those scenarios uh, need to be input into the planning process and used as basis for the planning process. The exposure elements are also there. Uh, you can see the exposure elements in terms of population, critical infrastructure, and so on. It's both in visual form, uh, vulnerability uh, criteria are also uh, input in, into the system, and it's in both visual form as well as uh, table form. So for example, if you select the type of hazard, you will be able to create the exposure elements and the vulnerability uh, information for every barangay. And it's the stakeholders and it's the LGUs that really put in those information. And when the demographic data are, are selected or, or filled up, there's a, an automatic response in terms of the assessment of risk uh, in terms of scores. So there's a table uh, for that. Uh, that uh, system is up and running. Uh, there's a room for a lot of improvement, but it is there. 
in Manila, we also uh, will be doing the Internet of Things. Uh, also, the, this, this Internet of Things is more commonly known as IoT. Uh, and it's very, very powerful because it gives us data that streams in near real time, uh, if not real time. Uh, it will depend on the cost if you want it real time or near real time. But uh, nonetheless, with the advances in technology, it allows us to uh, capitalize on uh, this kind of system for better information, which can be used for better science-based decisions or policies, if you may. Now, uh, we've had some experience uh, uh, on this uh, in NOAA, uh, putting up uh, a lot of sensors with DOST ASTI. These low-cost technologies have this kind of topology, uh, IoT, there are gateways, and they can be put in many parts of the city, which we will be doing. It can be street flood sensors, rain gauges, tide gauges, pollution meters, river water level sensors, as well as seismometers uh, for structural monitoring of buildings. Now, that kind of system will be put in their operation centers. Uh, hopefully, other LGUs will follow suit because uh, we can also monitor the different uh, catchment areas of Metro Manila that will lead to Manila Bay and pollute Manila Bay. So as early as in the upper watershed, uh, if we can already stop pollution that will eventually uh, pollute Manila Bay, we, if we can uh, stop pollution from the upper watersheds through monitoring with this IoT, then uh, we stand a better, better chance to clean up Manila Bay. Uh, these are the nodes that will be put in Manila for the IoT, for the Internet of Things. Uh, these are some examples of the seismometers that uh, we've been seeing. They're quite low cost. Uh, well, I think this one is, uh, if you want to hear an earthquake, uh, it also encourages education. It also encourages people to participate because if they're able to engage and be able to hear, for example, uh, an earthquake like this, which happened, uh, this one is 2018. I believe this one is uh, the latest earthquake, which can be uh, detected from Metro Manila. Uh, that would uh, inspire future generations of disaster scientists or seismologists which we badly need because our problem in the Philippines in terms of hazards is so huge and we need more scientists to work on that problem, um, problems related to, to such kind of uh, impacts. Um, uh, this is another example on how we can uh, make use. We can actually look at waves propagating from one end to another uh, that is the September 2020 Mindanao earthquake. It was seen from sensors in the United States. And you can see the ground roll being represented by uh, all of these seismometers deployed. We hope that we can deploy in the Philippines the same number of sensors so that people can get engaged and uh, get more timely information uh, with uh, the IoT and with the sensors, uh, low-cost sensors. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're doing it with uh, Mayor Isco. We hope that whatever product or whatever we create in the plans for Manila, uh, with all of the exports, uh, trying to help out and put together something uh, that is useful for Filipinos living in Manila, hopefully would also be uh, the same in other LGUs so that we can prepare well, anticipate well, and be able to stand against the threats of the different types of hazards that uh, plague the Philippines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lagmay. Uh, the basic principles that you highlighted in your presentation are I think very important to consider when we talk about technology design and adoption at the community level. So you said those principles are science-based, transdisciplinary, participatory, promotes capacity building, 
sustainable and uses advanced technologies yet low cost and the last principle to my mind is a critical factor to consider in developing countries such as the philippines okay so our next presentation um will tackle not just about using smart solutions in making the delivery of financial services efficient and secure especially at this time of the pandemic where contactless transactions um, are becoming the norm we will see we will also see in his in her presentation that innovation can thrive in a regulated industry if you have a regulator that is forward looking and open to change and our next presenter is the director of the center for monetary and financial policy of the banco central and filipinas or bsp before the bsp she was a research consultant at the world bank and an assistant professor at the department of economics of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. She obtained her bachelor's degree in statistics from the University of the Philippines and her PhD in economics from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, Director Laura Ignacio. Come, Laura. Good morning. Okay, let me just uh, share. Okay. Okay. So, Dr. Celia Reyes, colleagues in the government service, those in the private sector and in the academe, good morning, everyone. Am I coming in clear? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so, with the PIDS, I would like to thank everyone who is watching the webinar and supporting this annual recognition of the importance of policy research in development planning and policy making. So for this year, the PIDS has come up with an interesting, very interesting and very relevant topic combining technological innovations and governance, what they call smart governance. And this refers to the use of innovations in technology to improve the delivery of public services. So for the BSP, this definitely refers to fintech or innovations in uh, financial technology. Okay, so in general, fintech refers to technology-enabled innovation in financial services and payments. So fintech has transformed and continues to transform the financial sector and financial products and services and the payment system. The increased digitalization has enabled consumers and businesses to transfer value instantaneously. It provides convenience at a lower cost. But there are also risks. An important role of the financial sector is to provide efficient ways for households and businesses to make and receive payments. A well-functioning payment system facilitates economic activities and supports long-term economic growth. Central banks are responsible for maintaining the safety and integrity of the payment system. One of the mandates of the BSP is to provide a safe, efficient and inclusive payment and settlement system. As the authority with the oversight over the payment and settlement system in the Philippines, the BSP has the responsibility to monitor developments in this area. We have to make sure that the payments infrastructure is safe while it is efficient and fast. We have to identify potential risk and evaluate whether new regulations are necessary. So allow me to start with an overview of the BSP's payment system. The BSP is the operator of the Philippine Payment and Settlement System, or the PhilPass, implemented in 2002. It is a real-time gross settlement system which manages large value transactions. In 2015, the BSP launched the National Retail Payment System, or NRPS, framework which is envisioned to create a safe, reliable, affordable, interoperable, 
and efficient retail payment system in the country. Under the NRPS, the BSP encourages the use of electronic payments or modern financial technologies to enhance the speed, convenience, and affordability of financial transactions. The NRPS became operational with the formation of two automated clearinghouses, which I think most of you are familiar with, the PESONET and the InstaPay. The PESONET is being promoted as a viable alternative to checks and recurring bulk payments, while the InstaPay is a substitute for coins and cash. In turn, the PESONET and InstaPay facilitated another two important initiatives of the national retail payment system. These are the government e-payments facility or e-GovPay via the PESONET and the national quick response code standard QRPH via InstaPay. The e-GovPay facility digi digitized the government collections and disbursements it resulted in more efficient govern, government collection, better audit, enhanced transparency, and eventually curved revenue leaks. The adoption of the national QR standard or QRPH has transformed the fragmented QR-driven payment services into interoperable payment solutions. It eliminated the need for the merchants and customers to maintain several accounts and for the merchants to display numerous QRs. As of end August 2020, PESONET has 60 participating financial institutions, while InstaPay has 47. Let us now look at the trends of these innovations with the onset of the pandemic and the subsequent quarantine restrictions. Data show that there is growing preference for digital transactions. More clients of payment service providers have been leveraging on the benefits of PESONET and InstaPay, as these are seen as safer and convenient in making payments and transferring funds. Uh, for the PESONET and InstaPay transactions, the top two charts, comparing the combined performance of PESONET and InstaPay transactions for the first quarter and second quarter of the, of the year. There is a notable increase in volume and value by 122% and 50% respectively. The increase is partly attributed to the financial assistance extended by the social security system to micro, small, and medium enterprises via PESONET in May of 2020. There is also the Department of Social Welfare and Development Social Amelioration Program, where disbursements to around 1 million beneficiaries shall be transferred by the Land Bank of the Philippines through PESONET. Parallel to this, the volume and value of ATM withdrawals dropped by almost 30% and 25% and for the first 45 days under ECQ compared with the same period prior to ECQ. A similar trend was seen in uh, check payments. So the volume also declined by 70% and the value declined by 60%. The lowest volume and value of ATM withdrawals and check payments year to date were observed in April of 2020 when the ECQ was in effect for a full month. So this increase in PESONET and InstaPay transactions was further supported by the waiving of PESONET and InstaPay transfer fees of the major payment service providers since the start of the community quarantine. So some uh, financial institutions have extended the suspension of fees until September 2020, while others have prolonged the waiver up to the end of December 2020. Prior to this, the, BX, the BSP extended a temporary waiver of fees for fund transfer transactions made through PhilPass from April 1 until the end of 2020. So with this relief measure, the financial institutions in turn we're strongly encouraged by the BSP to extend similar relief to users of digital fund transfer services 
and the ATMs. Now for the eGov pay transactions, uh, the lower, your lower left hand chart. There is also an increase in eGov pay transactions, which reflects the increasing public awareness of the digital facility. The facility is being recognized as a safe and efficient means of payment for taxes, licenses, permits, and other obligations to the government. Since the platform's launch in November 2019, there has been a marked increase in both transaction volume and value. 688% increase in volume and 799% increase in value. Also, the number of government billers enrolled in this facility expanded from only two when it started. And now, um, as of June 2020, there are 277 government billers. The top biller is the Bureau of Internal Revenue, followed by the Philippine National Police, Environmental Management Bureau, and Overseas Workers Welfare Administration. For the QRPH transactions, uh, lower right hand, the demand and supply of QR-enabled payment services have likewise been showing increasing trends. The volume and value of person-to-person -person transactions showed a sharp growth of 1,214% increase in volume, 1,374% increase in value. So as mentioned earlier, the use of electronic payments is greatly encouraged with the, with the zero fees on PesoNet and Instapay, and also with the digitalization of payments, such as transfers or social benefits and wages. The increase in digitization and the public's acceptance and greater usage of these electronic platforms also promotes financial inclusion, which is a major advocacy of the Banco Central. In parallel with the promotion of digital payments, the BSB carries out other initiatives. One, in 2018, the BSB introduced the Basic Deposit Account, or BDA. It's a no-frill bank account with an opening amount of 100 pesos or less, no maintaining balance, no dormancy charges, and simple requirements, such as uh, official identification document. As of the end of 2019, there are 120 banks offering basic deposit account, 4 million BDA depositors, amounting to 3.5 billion deposits. There is also an expansive network of low-cost touch points, with BSP allowing more cash agents as well as e-money agents. So banks are allowed to serve clients through retail outlets as cash agents, which can, sec, which can accept and disburse cash on behalf of the bank. Uh, we have also branch light units, which can provide a wide range of products and services depending on the market needs of a specific area or locality. So these arrangements allow consumers to access financial services such as remittance transfers, even without having a bank account. So finally, the BSP takes an active role in pushing for the implementation of the Philippine National ID System, or PhilSys, in collaboration with the Philippine Statistics Authority and other agencies. This is to establish a verifiable digital identity for Filipinos. It will also enable them to open bank accounts and use financial services more efficiently. So notwithstanding all these benefits that may arise from the increase in digitization, the BSP is also mindful of the potential risk, such as there could be a disruption in financial services. So even where a digital payment infrastructure is in place, if you quickly scale up the services, such as what is happening now during the pandemic, it, it, it could provide or it could lead to operational risk, including system capacity constraints, 
and or the unavailability of critical staff, particularly if the staff are affected by quarantines or illness illnesses. Second uh, possible risk is the usual fraud or cyber attacks. So if, if you scale up the system without, um, without the safeguards and regulations uh, keeping, uh, keeping up or not in place, uh, there tends to be a propensity for fraudulent schemes or scams, uh, such as the phishing, um, uh, the malicious websites, or the phishing emails. So preventing these cyber crimes is a shared responsibility. So other than the strict security measures required by the financial institutions, the financial clients themselves must protect their own personal uh, financial information and remain vigilant or be aware of your surroundings with, or, or be vigilant when you're doing financial transactions online. And of course, the third risk is if there is a diversion of funds to money laundering and financing of terrorism. So given these potential benefits and risks, Monetary and financial regulators need to have a balanced approach to risk and growth by keeping pace with the latest developments in the financial markets, promoting innovations and healthy competitions while at the same time addressing consumer protection issues and managing financial stability risk. So the BSESP has established a regulatory environment that do not stifle innovations, um, but ensure that risks are effectively managed. So the approach is threefold. One is the BSP ensures that regulations are risk-based, proportionate, and fair. So we are making use of risk-based regulation and supervision. Second, we maintain active stakeholder collaboration. Uh, with, um, with the industry and with the users or consumers. Uh, third, we ensure consumer protection. This is done through communication campaigns, um, financial literacy programs, cybersecurity awareness programs. And these principles are implemented through a flexible test and learn approach, or what we usually call the regulatory sandbox. So by being able to manage risk, we can leverage on these financial innovations, harnessing the potential benefits for inclusive economic growth. Um, there, there's another uh, critical consideration uh, that I could main mention. It is the poor condition of internet connectivity. So particularly if you go farther from the urban center, uh, centers. So the condition may worsen uh, with the uh, pandemic or the restrictions when the reliance of people on online transactions take up higher bandwidth, it will slow down the internet and subsequently causing people uh, or the public frustration. So this may lead to a loss of trust in digital payment facilities. So we have to be mindful of that uh, challenging situation as well. Okay, so the BSP, is carrying out major organization, organizational reforms and initiatives for a more proactive supervisory and regulatory stance. We are exploring regtech, what we call regtech or subtech solutions to enhance the timeliness and quality of our risk-based decision-making. This includes the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud computing, and application programming interface systems. So in uh, September of last year, in Singapore, the BSP won two, uh, two awards, uh, or awards in two categories. One is the Data Management Initiative with the development of a prototype API-based prudential reporting system, and the second award for the artificial intelligence for the development of a prototype chatbot, an automated, uh, automated complaint handling portal. So the BSP recently launched this chatbot 
nicknamed Bob or BSP Online Buddy. So Bob handles automated complaints to provide the public with a more accessible and efficient means to engage the BSP on financial consumer concerns. So the chatbot can efficiently handle queries from consumers sent through the web chat in the BSP website, SMS, or uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, by using artificial intelligence and natural language processing, Bob can respond to queries and complaints in English, Tagalog, or Taglish. And then to complement the first one, the use of API-based reporting for financial institutions, for those financial institutions that cannot immediately migrate to the newer technology, the BSP also provides a financial institution portal or FI portal, which provides a single electronic platform upon which the financial institutions can submit reports, receive feedback, exchange correspondences with the BSP on matters related to report submissions. It also offers a more secure process of submission through web facility where the financial institutions can upload their reports instead of sending them via email. And also it, it enhances transparency as both BSP and the financial institutions will get to see identical documents available in the portal. Okay, so what are we expecting in the, um, in the near future and what must be done? Um, BSP experiences with the pandemic show the critical role of digital platforms in financial transactions and the economy in general. So there is no arguing that the new normal ushers the reliance of both the people and the economy on digital platforms. We expect an increased preference for doing banking and payment transaction online as consumers realize the convenience and safety of digital banking. So as economic transactions shift to online platforms, there will be greater demand for online payment, savings, investment, and other financial services. Um, there will also, uh, there could also be a demand for financial products or insurance products and claims following the increasing number of in, uh, infections and fatalities caused by the pandemic. So given these developments, we need to strengthen what we must do. We need to strengthen infrastructure for and regulation of online financial services and um, strengthen financial inclusion by leveraging on financial technology. So to summarize, allow me to highlight three main points from the presentation. One is that the pandemic and the subsequent restrictions has accelerated the adoption and usage of technological innovations in the payment system. Secondly, while these innovations have provided benefits to consumers and businesses, we have to be aware that they also present risk that regulators would have to manage. And then the third, the BSP remains vigilant against potential risk to allow consumers and businesses to reap the benefits of innovations. With a balanced approach to financial innovation, the BSP strives to create an enabling environment for new technologies and digital transformation. Moreover, the regulations shall continue to adjust to these developments so as not to compromise consumer protection standards and ensure the welfare of the consumers. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Ignacio. Very important um, takeaways in your last slide. I was particularly drawn to your sixth slide, which shows the BSP regulatory framework. And I think it, this explains why we have this um, financial system which is quick to adapt to change, particularly in terms of uh, shifting to digital payments. Indeed, it is, it is about uh, striking the right balance between regulation and innovation. Our last speaker is the Chief Executive Officer of Thinking Machines, a leading uh, data technology or data science technology startup 
with offices in Manila and Singapore. And our, her company has um, her company has published original research in artificial intelligence at top industry conferences, such as the International Conference on Machine Learning. And um, uh, said company is part of the UNICEF Innovation Fund to build open source artificial intelligence models to help address poverty and development issues. Ladies and gentlemen, here now is Ms. Stephanie C, who will be presenting on um, mapping poverty in the Philippines using machine learning and open geospatial information. Missy? Hi, thank you. Um, it's, it's a huge honor to be on this panel with um, giants in the field. Uh, my team and I hope to contribute something unique to the PIDS proceedings from our perspective as machine learning specialists. Um, so our presentation will go narrow and deeply into the usability of machine learning for estimating socioeconomic indicators. Uh, it is much more of a, I think, scientifically grounded uh, and like very narrow uh, presentation. But what I hope to do here um, is to demystify um, how machine learning um, and open source um, geospatial data sets um, are useful uh, for development studies um, and policy uh, in this space. Um, I hope that at the end of this presentation, um, the published papers and open source tools I'm linking uh, will inspire some of you to rethink your data strategy um, and inspire others to pursue complementary lines of research, levering the work we've already done, uh, because I think this is a very exciting, uh, growing uh, space in the field. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Thinking Machines is a um, private sector firm uh, with a social impact mission. Um, we um, spend most of our time building artificial intelligence um, and data platforms for large corporations. Um, we work with a lot of private equity groups, telcos, and so on. Uh, but we try to reserve a quarter of our time to work on uh, civic initiatives. So our social impact mission is to empower evidence-based policy and action by, uh, one, filling in critical data gaps, um, two, uh, making data open and useful, and three, innovating with purpose. Um, how do we do that in our day to day? Uh, first, we have built open source libraries that are shared freely with the public available for use. Uh, open source is this big global push in the technology sector uh, to make uh, software open. Um, next, in terms of open data and uh, making data open and useful, uh, we are strongly involved in the open data initiatives in the Philippines. Uh, so we work very closely with the OpenStreetMaps team uh, that produces points of point of interest data that, again, is freely available uh, to everybody for any kind of use. Um, we've worked with the Department of Health to help them open source some of their data sets, uh, and we care a lot about uh, transit data sets. We work closely with ways uh, to open source um, uh, vehicle uh, jam data sets. Um, and last, in terms of innovating with purpose, uh, we work a great deal with the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, and through them, uh, the DBM, DOH, and the League of Cities on various initiatives to promote data-driven policy decisions. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, presentation specifically um, is about if machine learning can be used to support development studies uh, with cheap and fast data inference methods. Um, so when, um, when doing research, a very important piece is uh, data gathering. And sometimes that is the most time-consuming element um, of uh, a development study. Um, so we have spent the last two years um, building a series of studies to combine uh, cost-efficient machine learning techniques with free and accessible geospatial data sets to see if we can create a fast, low-cost, and scalable means of providing poverty estimates. Um, so specifically, uh, this presentation goes over the extent to which geospatial data, so remote sense data, uh, digital activity data sets, and crowdsource information, uh, how, how well can it be used to estimate uh, socioeconomic well-being in the Philippines? Um, we are working, our, um, our, our test and training data set comes from the 2017 Nash, National Demographic and Health Survey. Uh, that is what we are trying to see if we can estimate the DHS factors uh, from um, digital data sets. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just to um, explain what the DHS is, uh, every four to five years, uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority runs a very, very granular uh, survey uh, so on a per household level, um, they, um, interview, um, they interview 
um, a nationally representative sample of households uh, to capture key demographic and health indicators uh, for the households across the Philippines. Um, so most recently, the DHS was run in 2017. Um, and uh, from uh, in that data set, we have 27,496 households that were successfully interviewed, uh, comprising a representative nationwide sample um, of, of households across the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what we are trying to do is to try to see if we can use unconventional data sets, satellite imagery, social media data, uh, other geospatial data sets, feed those into machine learning models and validate if we can um, if we can accurately uh, estimate uh, the DHS, uh, some of the DHS socioeconomic factors. Uh, so some of the key ones we looked at are education level, uh, electricity access, um, and wealth index. Um, we took several approaches to the problem. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit over our journey here. Uh, so first, we used a deep learning approach, which trained an AI model to read satellite imagery and infer wealth from that. Um, and then second, we modified our approach to see if we could train a cheaper, faster AI model, uh, not on sat without using satellite imagery, but yes, with using Facebook data and open source uh, geospatial data. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, the goal here is to support surveyors and decision makers by using tech to infer useful data for areas where surveys are not feasible. Um, I do want to emphasize that this, these methods will never replace the DHS survey. Uh, they will never replace ground truth surveys because if you think about how machine learning models are trained, uh, it's like uh, you have to show the AI model many, many examples for it to learn from, and then it then takes its learnings and predicts. But how do you know if it's predicting correctly? Uh, you need uh, ground truth validated uh, results to check against. So the way that we always see uh, machine learning models and um, ground truth surveys working together is it's, it should be complementary. Uh, they should never be treated as uh, replacements for each other. Um, next slide. Um, so uh, the field in, in, in our space of um, AI and machine learning, there's been a lot of really interesting research coming out um, on using uh, these methods for uh, development studies. Um, these studies have mostly been coming out in uh, machine learning conferences. Uh, so ICML, NeurIPS, KDD, the big machine learning conferences almost always have uh, a workshop on, um, on um, AI for social good, uh, AI for development studies, AI for climate change. Um, and about four years ago, um, there started to be an explosion of research in uh, using uh, deep learning on satellite imagery to predict, um, to predict wealth factors. Uh, so the Stanford Sustainability and AI Lab um, wrote one of the pioneering uh, studies on this. They estimated asset-based wealth for five sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and so our first approach was to see if we can replicate this work uh, in the Philippines. Um, so you can see here on the right uh, is a visual of the, provincial, the, the ground truth data set. Uh, this is the provincial level wealth index across the Philippines. Um, I hope the results are not, not a surprise to anybody uh, in terms of uh, relative wealth across our country. Uh, next slide, please. The core intuition of this approach um, is that if you are able to train an AI model to look at satellite imagery, uh, you should be able to infer uh, wealth. Um, so this is a snapshot from, um, uh, in, uh, from um, uh, Bonifacio Global City, uh, kind of one of the uh, one of the barangays uh, near where um, near where our offices are, um, and if you can see uh, the difference between the the um, barangay on the left, the area on the left, and the area on the right. So you, if if you just look at it, right, um, your intuition. If I asked any human being which half seems wealthier, um, I would feel very confident in saying that. Um, most people would choose the left side as being the wealthier side. Um, and why, right? And if I, every, every time I ask people to think about it, I get the same answers. Uh, the houses look bigger, one. Uh, they have more spacing, two. Uh, they have more greenery um, between the homes, three. Uh, the roads also seem bigger. They're not actually bigger, but they, they seem bigger is one I hear a lot. So um, if you asked a human being to look at every square kilometer 
uh, of, of the Philippines and ask that person to generate um, a wealth uh, a wealth score across the country, uh, on this basis, you'd get pretty far. Uh, but that's like absurdly expensive and like crazily time consuming. So can you train a machine learning model to do something very similar? Um, and here's the methodology that this uh, the Stanford lab used. Uh, next slide, please. So um, ideally, what you would have is you would have a lot of satellite images. You'd label all of them. You'd use that label data to train a machine learning model to then recognize ah, the bigger houses mean wealthier, right? Um, and then you then have your poverty predictions, wealth index, education, access to water, electricity, child mort mortality uh, coming out at the end of that. Uh, but the problem is that we do not have uh, enough labeled training data that's labeled directly on satellite imagery. Uh, and you need a lot of data in order to implement an end-to-end -end, uh, deep learning model. So if that labeled satellite image data doesn't exist for the Philippines, uh, it doesn't exist for sub-Saharan Africa, uh, how do you uh, overcome this data gap? Uh, next slide, please. So um, what the um, Stanford AI lab did is uh, they use this insight where they use nighttime lights as a proxy for economic development. Um, so here you have two images of Metro Manila during the daytime from satellite imagery um, and the nighttime uh, data set of brightness across Metro Manila, uh, which comes from uh, a NOAA uh, data set uh, that is made publicly available uh, by uh, the, the, the US group. Um, so here you like intuitively, um, you can see um, the main uh, commercial areas of Metro Manila at night. Uh, you can see uh, the suburbs and the byways and highways of Metro Manila. And intuitively, it does make sense that nighttime lights could be a strong proxy for economic development. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is reflected in um, not just in urban areas, but also in rural areas where you see here uh, in the daytime, um, if, if I looked at it and you asked me where the um, cultivated uh, or more developed areas were, I could kind of give you a few guesses. But if you look at the right, if you look at the nighttime nightlight data, then it becomes much clearer where uh, human habitation is and where human development might be. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so charting it all out, right? Um, so if we, what, what we did is we took all of the uh, 1,200 sample locations or clusters in, 20, in the 2017 DHS data set and graphed it against uh, nightlight luminosity. Uh, so you see the average household wealth index, which is a number coming from the DHS versus luminosity. Uh, if you look, the way to read this is every circle here represents a cluster of two or more surveyed households uh, with a unique lat long uh, that it was identified during the DHS. And you see the nighttime radiance here and you see the average household wealth here, the poorer to richer, you see there is somewhat of a positive correlation uh, in this. So that uh, kind of validates our intuition. Um, next slide, please. So what do we ask the machine learning model to do? Um, we predict nighttime light intensity as a proxy task. Um, we take the daytime satellite imagery, um, we, we formulate this problem then uh, where we map the daytime satellite images to the corresponding night, uh, nighttime light intensity levels given by the pixel brightness values. Uh, we use a convolutional neural network uh, pre-trained on the ImageNet data set. Uh, essentially what we're doing is by mapping daytime satellite images to nighttime lights, we can extract patterns from the images. Uh, these patterns come in the form of low, low dimensional feature embeddings that are indicative of wealth. Uh, patterns that are associated with brighter lights uh, include things like bigger building sizes, more structured road networks. Uh, meanwhile, dimness um, is um, the, the patterns that correspond to dimness um, consist of rural areas, so forests, plains, small dispersed houses. Um, so what we're doing is we're training the AI model. Instead of telling it, hey, look at bu bigger building sizes, we just tell it brighter areas are more indicative of wealth. And it then uh, kind of discovers um, some of the pattern based pieces uh, that say bigger houses, uh, larger roads, more structured, uh, more structured uh, housing setups. Um, that's all inside of this convolutional neural network uh, AI model now.
Uh, so the main takeaway is that for every image, we, for every new daytime satellite imagery that we then uh, show the model, it'll then be able to give us a prediction of, uh, it'll, it'll, give us, uh, it'll be able to recognize the particular patterns in the image. And from those patterns, it'll say what it believes to be the wealth uh, index um, of, that, um, of that image. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, the feature embeddings, meaning the patterns uh, that, that can be seen, um, we, are, um, uh, we, are, we are then able to compute the average feature embedding for cluster. And then we use those features as an input to a secondary model. So uh, in this case, we, um, uh, in, in model replication, uh, we wanted to use the same thing they did. So uh, we use a ridge regression model uh, to come from the feature embedding. So the patterns, again, um, what patterns are associated with wealth? We take those feature embeddings, we feed it into a secondary ML model, and then we come up with the socioeconomic indicators. Um, so the um, one thing, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing a study like this, uh, one big tip um, I would like to share is that uh, something that will make your work much easier is by yeah, removing all images that contain no human settlements. Um, and the way you can do that is by using the HRSL the, uh, uh, data set uh, that uh, Teek et al. have uh, created and shared. Um, so that's the um, uh, a human settlement uh, data set uh, that is pretty up to date, very global, uh, very useful. Um, so next slide. Um, so if you're interested in the exact details of how this is done, uh, we have um, published the paper on this and we've also open sourced the AI model for that. Uh, but maybe for this audience, what's more important is the level of accuracy of this. Um, so this is pretty, this, tends, this is uh, decently accurate. Uh, the chart below shows the estimated and predicted wealth index uh, versus the actual wealth index as computed by the DHS. Um, and our uh, model is able to explain 62.5% uh, of the variance, so an R squared of 0.625, uh, which is pretty in line with, uh, uh, with um, the Stanford study, which uh, generated R squareds of, I think, 0.5 to 0.7 uh, for sub-Saharan African nations. Um, so the uh, next slide, please. Um, so once you do the visual recreation, uh, you can see that it does uh, quite well. So on the left side here, you see the actual wealth index. Uh, on the right side, the predicted wealth index from the machine learning model. Uh, one interesting thing about the machine learning model is it does quite well in the middle ranges, but for the extremes of wealth and the extremes of poverty, uh, it does a poorer job, uh, probably because there's less training data uh, in, uh, for those particular extreme situations. Again, for machine learning models, the more examples of something you feed it, the better it'll be able to recognize uh, the patterns uh, that follow that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so having um, done that work uh, to validate the usefulness of this method, uh, we then decided to do something um, uh, a bit more uh, uh, expanding on that work, uh, which is to use unconventional digital data sets. Uh, such as uh, Facebook marketing data, OpenStreetMap data, and Check My School data to see if we, um, if uh, how well these unconventional uh, data sets can be used to infer wealth. Uh, one main problem with using satellite imagery is that it's very expensive uh, to buy satellite imagery, number one. And two, it's computationally expensive to process um, gigabytes of satellite imagery uh, to to produce this uh, to produce this model. Uh, so now that we knew that nighttime lights itself was a pretty useful indicator, what we then wanted to see is with just these four things: that's nighttime lights, Facebook, uh, OpenStreetMap, Check My School, and a few other open, uh, uh, less important open data sets. Um, can we build a faster, cheaper model uh, that is at least as accurate as the satellite imagery model? Uh, so next slide, please. Um, and the reason why we thought this was worth pursuing is because when we did an exploratory analysis, uh, one data set that Facebook you can pull from Facebook is the percentage of a population in a uh, in a pretty small area that has 4G access, uh, that has 2G access, that has 3G access. So that is a really really fascinating um, um, piece of information that correlates very well with the wealth index. Um, so if you see in the chart in the upper left. Uh, the percentage of the population with 4G versus the wealth index, there's a positive uh, relationship there. And the percent, if you look at the next slide, on, uh, next chart on the right, uh, the percentage of the population with 2G um, versus wealth index is, um, 
um, strongly related, uh, but it is like an inverse uh, correlation. So this is very heartening to see. Um, and uh, we ended up um, running uh, with this model. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so this model then, um, we evaluated, uh, we took all of these public data sets um, from Facebook, roads data sets, uh, building data sets from OpenStreetMaps, POI data sets from OpenStreetMaps, and nighttime light statistics, had it into five different classic machine learning models that have more interpretability than a uh, deep learning model, um, and then tried to see how well uh, these, these models could predict socioeconomic indicators. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so of all the models, of all the classic models that we tried, the random forest regression model performed the best with an R squared of 0.66. Uh, so these are all validated uh, with a five-fold nested cross-validation approach. Um, and this is pretty exciting for us because it aligns very well with the, predictive, uh, with the results of predictive models uh, that have been done around the world, uh, not in the Philippines yet. So in Haiti, the R squared of the uh, Gene et al. model went 0 is 0.51 and the highest was around at 0.75. Um, and I think the 0.66 is a good, um, it, is a good, maybe not starting point, but is a good um, benchmark uh, for anybody doing further work in this space. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to show the visual, um, the reconstructed uh, provincial level map of this data set uh, is, is, a little bit, uh, is a little bit better um, and does better um, at identifying where there is um, relatively less wealth in a region. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one, one problem with this type of model is that, interestingly, it does not generalize well to other socioeconomic indicators. Um, so you see here, these are the results. These are the results of uh, the model uh, predicting uh, actual wealth index, uh, proportion of households with toilet located outside, higher educational att attainment, uh, poor or unimproved water source and time to get to the nearest water source. And so while it does relatively well with the wealth index and somewhat well, some, somewhat decently on households with toilets located outside, it does very poorly on uh, educational attainment, on the availability of water. Um, and I do want to point out that that is consistent with the conclusions reached uh, by Andrew Head and his team, uh, which states that high performance on satellite imagery trained models uh, can't be expected when there's no clear relationship with the development indicator and nighttime lights. So nighttime lights is actually still one of the strongest um, 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 sources of information uh, for this model. Next slide, please. Um, when we looked at the feature importance, so one thing you cannot do with a deep learning model is you can't actually do feature importance. It is more, much more of a black box model, uh, which motivated our work here uh, using more interpretable models. Um, so this is um, the ranked list of the feature importances, uh, relative feature importances in the wealth index prediction model. And if you see here, nighttime lights is still by far uh, the, the, uh, the feature that is most important uh, in determining whether an area is wealthy or not. Uh, but very interestingly, um, but very interestingly, um, you see that coming up like pretty closely behind it, the thing that contributed the most to the improvement of this model's performance is the percentage of the population using 4G, uh, percentage of the population using 3G, uh, the number of schools in the area, and the percentage of the population using 2G. Um, this is very interesting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these results are further validated with, an, uh, with a Shapley analysis. Um, you can see here, again, uh, similar results visualized differently uh, with, a, with a different analysis that nighttime lights is a very strong indicator, but 4G, but telecommunication access um, has a very, very interesting relationship with wealth. Um, so an area of further research uh, we'd like to go into is figuring out, is this, this because telcos are particularly good at identifying areas that are becoming wealthier? Uh, telcos uh, in the Philippines do invest a huge amount um, of CapEx. I believe uh, between um, Globe and Smart, they spent about uh, 8 billion pesos in um, building out uh, broadband and telecommunications access uh, in the last, uh, it, it just in 2019. Um, so are they particularly good at identifying areas becoming wealthier? Or is there more of a causative relationship? Does increasing 4G access in an area cause a growth in wealth? Um, and this is where I thought the BSP study was really interesting because um, 
if you give people more access um, to um, ways to transact financially, uh, which require telecommunications access, um, maybe there is a positive relationship there. Um, so now I'm coming towards the end of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so essentially our work over the last two years has shown that yes, we can use unconventional data sources to infer socioeconomic indicators in ways that support ground truth studies. So our first study replicates existing global uh, methods and validates that it's useful in the Philippine context and gives a benchmark uh, for policymakers and researchers uh, to use, um, uh, hopefully. And second, our second method improves on the first by being a much more explainable method, an interpretable method, and a much cheaper method. Uh, the first method costs about $1,000 per run of cloud compute because of the expense and the size of these uh, satellite imagery data sets. But the second model, uh, the second set of models, they all run in five minutes with a per cost run of about $20 on a cloud computing platform. So we use Google Cloud Platform. And this is a cost level which enables iteration and experimentation. Uh, you don't need to um, plan for two months to run, to do one run, and then you're doomed if the run doesn't work out well, right? Oh, I think that's my cue, which is perfect because um, I am done. Um, so um, with that, um, I hope that um, I hope that that was uh, next slide, please. Um, I hope that that was interesting. Um, my team, uh, we would like to we we would like to continue to participate uh, in deeper collaboration between industry, academia, and government to apply machine learning and big data methods. Uh, for uh, for support of a stronger Philippines. Uh, we're very interested in um, figuring out if we can do temporal estimations aligned with the 2022 DHS survey. Uh, so if there's anybody for the Philippine Statistics Authority uh, who wants to talk, uh, we'd be delighted. Uh, we want to explore further explore the causality of telco-related uh, wealth indicators, uh, and we want to find better ways to infer the non-wealth indicators, uh, so water access, for example. Um, and last slide, please. Um, th this work uh, is all part of our open science, open source commitment. Um, here is a list of some reference material. Uh, my email address is here. Um, we really hope to see uh, more uh, Philippine development researchers at uh, the machine learning conferences around the world. Uh, please, like, if, if you're interested in uh, publishing in any of these spaces, uh, please do reach out. Uh, we, are, we would be absolutely happy to uh, help you out. Um, okay, so that's it for me. Salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. It was a thought-provoking presentation. Indeed, accessing fast and reliable data has become more important than ever in the new normal because our decision makers need to make quick but well thought out uh, decisions to, re to respond to the rapidly changing environment. And your uh, presentation showed that while the new normal has posed some difficulties uh, in terms of data gathering, You've shown that uh, this shouldn't be an impediment because there are technologies that we can tap, such as machine learning models, social uh, media data, satellite, and geospatial technologies that can provide uh, data on uh, socioeconomic indicators. So, friends, we don't have uh, guest reactors for this session, as we would like the reactions to come from you. So, I think at this point, we are now ready to entertain your questions. So. May I request my um, our um, speakers to please um, um, enable your uh, videos, please, because we will now start with our open forum. So our first question, if I may direct this to uh, Dr. Actually, Dr. Mahar Lagmai has lots of questions as well as uh, Director Ignacio and a couple of questions for uh, Stephanie. So Dr. Lagmai, this one is from Nixon Kabote of the BSP. So he asks, as the world continues to be preoccupied with the current health crisis, how can we keep the focus of policymakers and authorities on the ongoing environmental challenges that are left unchecked, um, which could become the, the next source of global, global vulnerabilities and economic crisis? And if I may also um, have a follow-up uh, question, uh, this one is from uh, Director General Romulo Miral. It's also for you. He said the National Land Use Act has been pending in Congress for decades now. How is this affecting the preparation of local use plans and disaster risk management plans? Sir? Thank you, Sheila. 
Uh, I try to answer the best way I can the questions in the chat group. But uh, to repeat the answers, okay. uh, yes, maybe sir, this is a better platform for me to expound on it. Yes, sir. Uh, with regard to the question of yeah, with regard to the question of uh, Nick Kabotahe, uh, of course there will be problems, especially if we are occupied with the current uh, with efforts of the current pandemic. And may I add that even without the pandemic, we always tend to forget the, the things that we need to. I think the answer to that question is uh, better education, better awareness, so that we know what we need to push for uh, so that the authorities, the officials, will get to move uh, or to do the things that uh, are required of them to do in service of the Filipino people. There are so many things that need to be pushed for. And the problem is uh, the tendency of Filipinos is uh, to keep quiet. No? Uh, we also have, we, we, we always have to be vigilant. But uh, when we are vigilant, we need to have that basic knowledge on what we need to be vigilant about, what we need to push for. Uh, the Philippines is very big, and it's important that people uh, get educated, become aware of the things that uh, we need to get our mayors to do. No? Uh, not just mayors, but uh, everybody, all of the official, officials, that need to do their job well. And uh, if there is something that is uh, missing or is something that needs to be corrected, uh, we always discuss that in a civilized way so that it will come to uh, come up to the limelight so that people can act. No? Uh, we have to make a balance uh, between the, because there's some politics in there and we have to also be civilized. Uh, and in the end, it's, it's the science that needs to be followed. It needs to be logical. But to push for these things that I'm saying and what uh, Nick Kabotahe was uh, asking about, uh, it's not just about pandemics. It's a general tendency for people to forget and to be complacent. We need to be vigilant. But to be vigilant, we need to be knowledgeable. <laughs> we need to be aware of... Uh, what needs to happen, uh, and in this case, for the question of Nick, uh, what needs to be implemented? Because we have a lot of good laws that need to be implemented, that need to be followed. Okay, sir. Uh, regarding the question of DG Miral on uh, uh, given that the Land um, Land Use Act has uh, has been pending in Congress for decades now, so how is this affecting the preparation of local? Land use plans and uh, DRM plans. Uh, is that question addressed to me? Yes, sir. Ah, how is it affecting? Well, there's uh, uh, LGUs have been making their their land use plans. No, uh, they have been making their assessment for climate change and disaster risk. They have also been doing their DRM plans. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, although we're waiting for that uh, uh, bill to be acted upon, no? um, I think it's pending. I'm, I'm not sure what the, the current status is. But uh, so far, we have been creating the plans for all of these LGUs that we have held. And I believe that uh, those plans, which contains the vision of the community, uh, it's it's a, a very tedious process of engagement, of asking and consulting the stakeholders. But I believe that that is necessary if we are to uh, get the consensus of what the people in that community want in terms of managing their land. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lagmay. Uh, we have other questions here for you. Actually, you have uh, responded uh, to these questions in, in the chat box. However, for the benefit of uh, those who are not in WebEx but are uh, watching us on Facebook, may we have uh, your response. So uh, from Aniseto Orbeta, from Dr. Orbeta of PIDS, what are the major challenges that you have experienced in setting up 
information systems with LGUs and how um, did you deal with this? And oh, another question from uh, Dr. Orbeta, what data are generated by the systems and how are these being used to inform program design and policy making? Are there data ownership issues and can the data be shared with other analysts, sir? Dr. Lagmai? Oh, sorry. I, I thought that the question was for somebody else. Uh, so that was from Dr. Arrieta. Can, can you briefly just uh, uh, repeat in one sentence the question? Sure, sir. Okay, so from Dr. Arbeta, so he was asking about uh, the major challenges that you have uh, experienced in setting up information systems with LGUs and how okay. you okay. those challenges, sir. Yes, thank you very much again, Sheila. Um, basically, we, we found it quite easy to set up the information system. Uh, we found it easy because the LGU were very cooperative they were very cooperative and that made the process more quick and easy uh, the challenge is really to get the lgu convinced that they need such a system but once they have expressed their interest their willingness and they're very cooperative it's quite easy, especially now that that system has already been created. It's just a, a matter of, you know, replicating it in others. Because these digital systems, you know, once you've done it, you've coded it, and it's up and running, it's just a matter of uh, adding more data and doing it and applying it to other areas. Okay, thank you very much, sir. And. Um... Follow-up question from the from Dr. Orbeta too. Uh, what data can be generated or generated by the system, and how are these being used to inform program design and policy making? And um, are there uh, data ownership issues, and can the data be shared with other analysts? Okay, uh, I think there are many parts to that question. I'll, I'll answer first about the data. Uh, first, I'd like to make clear the differences between data and information and knowledge. Data is the, the one that you measure, that you collect or from interviews, from surveys, and uh, those data can be processed to generate information. And when you are able to generate information that can be useful and when it is used by the consumer or the, the, the end user, and if it's for a good uh, a purpose and for beneficial purpose, that is what we call as knowledge. Okay. Now, uh, in that information system, uh, the data coming, the demographic data comes from the stakeholders and the LGU. There are also scientific data sources which are provided by the agencies and also the scientific output of the UP uh, Resilience Institute team, which is composed of uh, product, we composed of a lot of experts from different fields. So these data are processed either automatically or with a review from the scientists and the engineers. And uh, there's there's an output for that uh, that's called the information. And because all of these information are useful for the planning process. And if it is or it becomes beneficial for the future of the community, then that, that is good knowledge output. Now, uh, data uh, information, we believe in open data. Mm -hmm. uh, the UPRI, that is one of the basic principles that we believe is necessary to uh, be able to uh, build trust uh, in communicating risk. Uh, science also needs to be trusted because the definition of science is that your methodologies need to be reproducible. If you do not have access, if the people don't have access to the data, then there will be no checks and balances because there's no scientific check or because there's no data available to the would-be checkers of the scientific output, which is the basis for uh, policy decisions. 
So we believe that uh, there must be trust in order for you or for the uh, authorities to be able to communicate. You can never ha communicate well if there is no trust. So open data is also very important because if we are to talk about uh, a whole of society approach, wherein the multidisciplinary work, it's not just scientists and engineers who work, we have to work with social scientists, with artists, with musicians, with statisticians, with mathematicians, social scientists like anthropologists and psychologists to understand the mindset of the Filipino people. Uh, we need to engage all of these uh, experts as well as the stakeholders, NGAs, NGOs, INGOs, everybody. And if we are to uh, have a transdisciplinary approach to solving our disaster problem, then everybody must have access to open data. And open data really opens a lot of opportunities, including education and awareness, which is uh, a very important building block in uh, the effectiveness and efficiency of the country's disaster risk reduction efforts and climate change adaptation efforts, because that's all based or founded on certain fundamentals. And those fundamentals include the use of science. And science needs to be reproducible. Thank you very much, Dr. Lagmay. Now, um, if I may jump to uh, Director Ignacio. Uh, Director Ignacio, we have some um, several questions from you. OK, let me um, begin with uh, the question of uh, Maria Carmela Romerosa. So he, she asks, given the high demand for e-payment system and the risk involved, what are the measures being undertaken by DST to assist the consumers or clients, particularly those in less urbanized or rural areas? So we're, we are talking here now of uh, uh, financial inclusion. So D Director Ignacio. Okay. Okay. For financial inclusion, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, one is the BSP. All um, we have the basic deposit account, so um, we are encouraging. Um, you could easily open a basic deposit account. It has a low, um, um, no um, minimum amount, and then. Um, uh, simple requirement for identification document. Um, so these are uh, some of the measures um, that uh, the BSP has for financial inclusion. But uh, because of the risk, uh, there are also a number of co uh, communication or public information campaigns uh, advising the public against um, uh, some uh, phishing scams or uh, like uh, use or, or to be very careful with your uh, financial, personal financial information. Um, what else? Uh, high demand for e-payment and the risk. What are the measures being undertaken? So uh, the BSP, for example, has issued Circular 808, which has a comprehensive information on, on technology risk management framework to um, uh, explaining uh, enabling service develop, uh, delivery in a safe and sound manner. Also a Circular 982 on information security management. Um, we are also working for the uh, legislative bill on financial uh, consumer protection so with this in place we could uh, have more guidelines or measures to for pro consumer protection thank you very much Direc director ignacio there is actually a uh, a related question um which is uh which was uh, from me angelica saludes of uh, the PCW or Philippine Commission on Women. So he's, she's a bit concerned about uh, vulnerable groups such as women, the elderly, and uh, she thinks that they will be left behind if gender responsive policies and enabling mechanisms will not work. 
So, for BSP, BBM policymakers, and other related institutions, can we then recommend that the 5% um, gender and development budget of all government agencies be given as a real budget for the provision of uh, cap debt and digital infrastructure for the next three years? Uh, I'm not sure if you would like to answer this, Director Ignacio, but any thoughts? Okay. Um, uh, okay. Okay. So, first of all, I agree that uh, with the high digitization and, and use of, say, uh, smartphones for um, financial transactions, it heightens the, the difference, um, not particularly the gender, but it, it heightens the differences between those who have access to smartphones and technology and those who do not have this. So it, it's, there's a divide. Okay. Secondly, um, there is a study. So this, date, this information on the gender or uh, socioeconomic indicators, I don't think we could get it from the transactions. Uh, for the transactions, as I have shown you, we can only get value and volume. But there is a survey done by the Better Than Cash Alliance report. And what it says here is that the Philippines is a global leader when it comes to women's economic participation and addressing the gender gap in the use of digital financial services. So while globally women are uh, 2 to 12 percentage points behind men in account ownership, Filipino women are nine percentage points ahead. Filipino women are also ahead of men by four percentage points in the uptake of digital payments. So this is a study by the Better Than Cash Alliance. So that's the information that we could provide. Okay, Director Ignacio, uh, you've mentioned earlier about the um, utilization of PesoNet and InstaPay. And, uh, Dr. Anisetter Beta is asking if um, if uh, the usage of these online payments, the inf information is, is there information in which um, socioeconomic sectors of our society are able to use these online payments? Um, as far as I know, and we, we cannot get in touch right now with the department um, that uh, works on this, but. As far as we know, the data on PesoNet and InstaPay only shows the value and volume, so it's, it's a transactions. So if, 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 um, if, if you're using PesoNet and InstaPay, you know that when you use it, you use your bank account to make transfers, and, and, and the transaction doesn't quite capture uh, socioeconomic, your income or your, or your gender. So these uh, socioeconomic indicators are actually captured by surveys. So similar to the study done by the Better Than Cash Alliance. Okay, thanks for the clarification, ma'am. Um, other questions for you this time is from uh, Chanel Rabe. So what are the initiatives of the BSP to support LGUs in integrating the e-payment system and financial technology in their operations? Are there template codes and capacity building programs that, must, that may be cascaded to LGUs for ease of adoption? Um, we have the eGov Pay, as I have dis uh, discussed earlier, to serve as a payment solution for streamlining the digitization of government collections and disbursements. So it's supposed to help um, uh, curb government revenue leaks or efficient collection means and enhance transparency. So um, it could benefit most LGUs as well. But I don't think we are aware of any template codes or capacity building programs um, uh, initiated by the BSP for the LGUs. Okay, ma'am. Thank you for uh, your response. Um, this one is from Angelo Alfonso Tesoro, and he's asking if, um, if we have any existing guidelines or documents here in the Philippines that were formulated to mitigate the use of... Uh, of this currency, of the digital currency or the cryptocurrency, uh, to cybersecurity threats. 
Okay. Um, in 2014, the BSP issued an advisory to the public, uh, informing the public of the features, the benefits, also the risk when dealing or when handling virtual currencies. So again, in 2017, the BSP issued another circular in the use of virtual currencies for payments and remittances in the Philippines. And also with that circular, the um, virtual currency exchanges are supposed to register under the BSP. So uh, because they uh, facilitate payments and remittances. Um, so if they are required to register with the BSP, they are also required to put in place adequate safeguards to address the risk associated with money laundering and counter terrorism, uh, counter uh, financing terrorism, uh, technology risk management systems and consumer protection mechanisms. So with the registration, they have to also comply with those other uh, requirements. Uh, these circulars can be accessed in the BSP website. Um, also, there's another uh, advisory on the use of virtual currency dated December 29, 2017. So this is advising the public uh, with regard to uh, fraudulent practices, trying to invite consumers to invest in bitcoins um, or uh, initial coin offerings. So these various um, circulars of the BSP may be downloaded or uh, acquired in the BSP website. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Ignacio. And, um... Last question for this round, uh, still for you. What are your views on institutionalizing or requiring e-payment in the public sector? Um, I guess you have to have, um, when you institutionalize, so you're, you're requiring uh, e-payments in the, I think the only constraint there are the infrastructures. If you have the infrastructure in place, then you very well can require um, everyone to use uh, e-payment. Uh, I guess the constraint there is for merchants who have no access, for consumers who have no access, then it would be difficult. So I, I would think instead of institutionalizing, encouraging would be a better word. Yes. So if we encourage everyone to use electronic payments and then little by little if the government or other institutions could help facilitate uh help with the infrastructure then if these are in place then it would be easier to ask everyone to use e-payments well said director ignacio okay so now it's uh, the turn of um, uh, miss stephanie c to answer some questions i i saw that she has been already uh, communicating with uh, some of our um, um, participants on WebEx, but for the information of those who are watching us on Facebook, Ms. C, uh, we have some questions for you from uh, Nixon Cabote. Okay. Um, how helpful are the study results for policy making given the substantial portion of the actual survey data? Given that the uh, substantial portion of the actual survey data remains unexplained by the model and taking into account the need for accuracy in socioeconomic policy as it involves uh, the lives and livelihoods of people. Uh, right. I think uh, there was a similar question in chat, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I do not recommend uh, that you use this uh, model in a mm -hmm. scenario where you need 100% accuracy. That's actually not... a uh, uh, I think that these models are very helpful when it comes to augmenting and uh, giving directionally, uh, giving like rough estimates of mm -hmm. where the wealth situation is moving, uh, mm -hmm. where 4G connectivity is higher. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, um, uh, but, but you should not use it for uh, these like high pressure, high risk uh, situations. Uh, please do remember that this is still, uh, um, there's usually a gap between when a new method comes out, uh, just like from science to policy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's a spectrum between science to policy of uh, when something is raw and worth iterating on, and when something is ready to go into production uh, or ready to be used on a daily basis. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So of the work we've done, um, I do want to say, though, that our results are very much in line with and improving it at the same level as, as the global studies uh, on machine learning. Uh, so when it comes to our ability to publish, and we've had our papers uh, accepted uh, at, at workshops uh, at ICML in Europe, and these are these really are the top machine learning conferences in the world. Uh, so this is good science. Now, mm -hmm. should you start using it tomorrow for policymaking? I would say not. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say you should use the, uh, for example, the 4G data sets and the night light data sets, uh, because we can see how useful they are uh, in uh, inferring wealth. You can actually capture those directly, right? So for right now, um, do you have any idea what percentage of your constituency has internet access? Um, I, I, that information is not really available from the telcos. Um, and I would bet that that information is not available to like 90% of LGUs. Uh, but what these studies show is that you can get this data from Facebook, and this data is like correlated well with wealth. So you can use that data, a percentage of population of 4G in itself as like a raw data set and in order to indicate uh, where which which areas in your uh, respective municipalities um, could be doing better or could be doing worse. It, it really is all indicators and part of a larger system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, second question from um, the same participant. How does the model correct intertemporal external validity issues, which are typically the main challenge for machine learning when analyzing socioeconomic data how often do we change the information feed on the training data to keep the results valid yes that's a great question um uh in in the last slide of our presentation i did mention that uh this is a geo this is uh the model that we've built um is um uh does like geospatial inferences but it does not yet mm -hmm. do temporal inferences exactly for the reason you pointed out right our ground truth study is the 2017 dhs data set and because mm -hmm. we didn't start doing this work until 2018, there's already a little bit of misalignment with uh, the ground truth data set, the DHS data set, and the data that we captured in 2018, the satellite imagery, uh, and the data we got from OpenStreetMaps, which is late 2018, I think early 2019. Um, ideally, what should happen is when the 2022 DHS survey comes out, we capture a, a temporarily connected slice of data across like that's what we're planning to do in 2022 uh, we capture that data temporarily across uh, all the different indicators that we identified now that we know where to focus our time and energy on uh, and when we we share that snapshot uh, as an as an open data set uh, and we share the model that we train at that point as an open data set um, and then from there we can start doing uh, these like more intertemporal uh, analyses uh, build these models and studies uh, but for now, our hard stop is that we can't do it because we don't have better ground truth uh, data. Uh, but thank you for bringing that up. That is like something I'm actually very excited to do in two years' time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Stephanie. And the third question, uh, does the model account for heterogeneity in Philippine regions and provinces, noting that growth and wealth drivers vary across entities in the data set? Yeah, um, the model can't uh, directly, one of the things is we're limited by our data source. Um, mm -hmm. So we're very much reliant on the uh, DHS, uh, the, the Philippine Statistics Authority's data set uh, for uh, our ground truth indicators for uh, uh, to have like a representative sample and representative clusters across the Philippines. Um, what I would kind of urge uh, people to look into, because I think the media's part of our research is really in uh, being able to capture uh, geospatial data sets using open street, street maps data uh, to see with the density of road networks, uh, using mm -hmm. Facebook marketing data to see the density of 3G and 4G and 2G access across the country, uh, and using the nighttime lights data sets. Because once you have those data sets, uh, you, you, you still can't measure some of these things directly, but then you'll have a stronger sense of the relationship between uh, infrastructure uh, development, road development, um, mm -hmm. and, and wealth. Uh, totally hear you. That is uh, one of the model's limitations as well. Okay. Um, okay, another question. Um, at which level of granularity are you confident in predicting levels of development? Uh, yes. Uh, so the level of granularity of these models uh, is 18 square kilometers by 18 square kilometers. Why? Uh, that's a hard limit driven by uh, the the 
DHS clusters because we train the data on DHS clusters, which are two or more DHS households that are within uh, the same region. So we computed, uh, we, we tried to compute for the ideal size, the smallest possible size of a cluster that would still have at least two houses, uh, households. Uh, and, that, and that is smallest uh, because there's only 27,000 households surveyed in the 27 DHS. Our, mm -hmm. our smallest possible granularity there for a training data set is 18 uh, square kilometers. Um, I also want to point out the word confident. Like, mm, it depends on what you're using it for, right? At an R squared of 0.66, I would not use this for anything that requires like 100% accuracy that is like direct household targeting. But I would be confident in using this uh, for an LGU dashboard or like a, 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 a nationwide mapping. Um, that improves on the current provincial level statistics uh, that are being provided. This gets you a little more zoomed in. Um, so, so the confidence level depends on uh, what you're trying to use it for. Okay. Um, another question for you from Evelyn uh, Morania. So what app or system could be used to map out areas with poor internet connection? that won't affect the quality of data? Any offline app or system or gadget recommendation? Uh, the, the question of um, mapping, I think um, I, I would want to ask for a bit more detail on what you're trying to map. Um, mm -hmm. what, um, um, what I think, it, it is like definitely a problem that we don't have a like, great connectivity, uh, which is why we use not just cell phone uh, not just connectivity data from Facebook, but we also use the nighttime lights data. Uh, mm -hmm. The nighttime lights data works even in places where there's uh, limited teleco connectivity. Uh, and being able to view sat via satellite imagery, the presence of road networks, plus getting from crowdsourced data sets, uh, the presence of points of interest, uh, such as schools, uh, such as schools, such as government facilities, uh, those are all non, those are all data sources that do not, that in, that are, related closely to wells, but do not require uh, that you have uh, connectivity uh, in terms of uh, cellular connectivity. Okay, and uh, we received a, um, a comment from uh, Dr. Jose Ramon Albert of PIDS. So he said, although the NDHS has some welfare indicators, the official welfare indicator in the Philippines is per capita income using the Family Income and Expenditure Survey. ADB and PSA have developed um, small area poverty maps, making use also of satellite imagery, such as luminosity together with census data to generate estimates of poverty at small areas. I wonder whether you work in thinking machine, in your working thinking machines has been validated with a, a uh, then he, um, he referred to a, a recent uh, ADB PSA work. Oh, um, I'd really appreciate if you could uh, reach out. Um, I believe that that uh, I would, yeah, it is part of the process of science to further replicate and validate this work. Uh, so I would really, uh, I, I haven't um, read those studies yet. Uh, so I'd really love to um, see how we can use it. And if that would be a better, uh, then number one, that it aligns with what we found. And number two, if we could, uh, um, yeah, use some of those methods or if they could use some of our methods. Uh, moving forwards, so that having added granularity and using night lights, um, I think that that uh, is exciting. I mean, I'm ex I think that there's a lot, there should be a lot of people doing similar research because these methods um, have been um, out there as open science for the last four years already. Uh, so that's really exciting. Um, if I could please get your uh, contact information, uh, that would be fantastic. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. We have a, um, a question here from one of our Facebook viewers, uh, Masi, Masi Awingan Hilaman, and this is for uh, um, Dr. Lagmai, sir. Uh, he asked, any update on the development of the communication risk protocols? Transparency and communication were two of the several major culprits identified in the Naga Cebu landslide incident on September 20, 2018. The same is now evolving in the case of the Dolomite sand carrying 74 kilometers away in Alcoy town in Cebu. <clears throat> okay, like my? I, I'm not sure if I uh, got the, I, I completely understood the question. 
uh, uh, like the, the question you? was about uh, developments on the understanding of what happened during the Naga landslide. Uh, I think two years uh, was that yeah two two years ago. Uh, yes, there's there, uh, yeah. there have been two papers that came out on uh, the the interpretation of that landslide. One of them came out uh, just month, uh, written by uh, myself as well as uh, some co-authors, and we emphasized the importance of understanding the nature of landslides. And there's this particular type of out relative to its height and uh, this also emphasizes the need to properly map out the hazards because when we look at the uh, disaster uh, risk plan uh, of the LGU we found out that the plan which was approved uh, already by the, uh, by by the concerned agencies uh, did not reflect those uh, areas where there were many deaths as a high hazard area. They were of a low hazard area, well, at least from that uh, disaster risk uh, management plan. Uh, so this, this only highlights that science is very important. Our understanding of the nature of landslides, especially of this type, which uh, relative to its height of collapse and its run out is very extreme. So it, it fell from a height of about 200 meters and its run out was, or the length of the landslide was 1.2 kilometers. So that means it had a ratio of one over six. Normally when we think of landslides, we only think of the cliff which falls down at its base but this one fell down and slid and de de generated an avalanching material which traveled uh, several kilometers long. One, uh, sorry, 1.2 kilometers long. So science is extremely important because that would be used for good decision making. Um, with respect to the dolomite, uh, I think that's a problem, of course. Mining uh, happens a lot in Cebu. Uh, mining also happens here in uh, Metro Man in the surrounding areas of Metro Manila. Uh, uh, it's it's a very very deep problem, and uh, it's all over the news. I I would rather that I I, I stop there, but uh, I'd like to just comment that going natural is always the best. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, uh, we already need to wrap up our open forum. Um, so at this point, uh, may I request our speakers to say a few words to our audience? Any, um, any last message, sir, starting from uh, Dr. Lagmaid and be followed by uh, Director Ignacio and uh, Ms. Stephanie. Any last words, Dr. Lagmaid? Oh, yes, I'll just keep it short. Um... Science and technology, if they are not embraced by the people, becomes meaningless. Uh, we need open data uh, to get people more educated, more interested in, in the science. We need open data to get and communicate better. Uh, those are fundamentals. Those are very important in effective and efficient disaster risk reduction efforts. So it's important that we not just uh, capitalize on expertise on the sciences and engineering. We should get also the artists, the psychologists, the, uh, the, the international community says that we have to uh, have a science-based approach and a whole of society approach to get them interlinked or network together, we have to open up the data so that there will be trust because trust is very important, transparency is very important, and that's what science is all about. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lagma. Now let me turn to Director Ignacio, but please, before um, giving your uh, final remarks, ma'am, um, I just received a, 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 um, a request from Ed Edmar Ubal, if you could answer this question. Uh, what are your thoughts on cryptocurrencies? 
especially Bitcoin, do you see the Philippine government supporting it? Director Ignacio. Um, okay. Um, our governor is very open to technological developments, uh, technical, technological innovations in finance. And he has, uh, the BSP has recently created a um, technical working group uh, to look into central bank digital currencies. Um, so it, it, it's a group having um, different departments from legal, uh, payments, monetary policy, financial supervision, um, financial inclusion, payments, uh, um, and then the TRISD or the tech, uh, Technological Innovation Department. So all of these departments are looking into the various aspects. So um, uh, what the recommendations will be, we'll know in the coming months. Uh, but we, we are looking into this development. Thank you very much, Director Ignacio. Any final words to our audience? Okay, so what we have learned this morning, one is the importance of communication. So we have all this information, the various agencies have all this information. We have to let the public know. So they would know the risk, they would know the benefits, they would um, uh, learn how to benefit from the, from the advantages and uh, take care of themselves with regard to the risk. Uh, we learn about collaboration. The government cannot do this uh, on its own. We have to um, collaborate with the private sector, especially with the technological innovations. And, and lastly, um, importance of education. As uh, Dr. Lagmay has mentioned, there is a need for scientists for the natural sciences. There is also a need for data scientists for, for um, technologies such as the cryptocurrencies. So for the students, um, education is valuable, so that's it. And thank you everyone for watching and take care. Thank you very much, Director Ignacio. And uh, Ms. Stephanie? Yes, um, echoing um, the um, importance of scientific thinking um, and algorithmic thinking. Um, I really would urge everybody, uh, you don't have to be a scientist to embrace algorithmic thinking. I think everybody in a healthy civic society, um, everybody should adopt this mindset of uh, questioning, right? Uh, this is why science is really important. This is why open data is really important in policy making, in decision making. Um, science ne almost never gives you a clear yes, no answer. Uh, it just indicates like my hypothesis, this piece of my hypothesis, what part works to what extent and what doesn't. And we keep building on each other's work. We keep questioning each other's work. Uh, and from there, we build uh, the truth, pretty much. Um, good policy, good decisions, and um, that that has a basis in uh, that has a basis in uh, reality. Um, so I, I really would like to thank everybody who um, joined today. Um, I'd really like to thank the people who sent me uh, some links and questions and opened up the door for collaboration. That's exactly what I want, right? I to continue being able to do open source, open data, open science. Um, so thank you everybody for your time. Um, I hope we all become better scientific thinkers. Thank you very much, Ms. C. So friends, please join me in thanking our speakers for the insights that they have shared in our webinar this morning. So let's give all of them a big virtual clap and thanks to thanks also to those who participated in the discussion. Okay, so at this point, and I'll call on the Vice President of PIDS, Dr. Marite Ballesteros for uh, the closing remarks. Good morning, everyone. And as uh, mentioned, this is the last uh, of the four webinar series for this year's annual public policy conference. In closing, I would like to conclude with a few thoughts on the key lessons from the four webinar series and how that fits into the overall theme on innovating governance for public resilience, for building resilience under the new normal. So first, uh, the opening message from Socioeconomic Planning Secretary Carl Chua was clear to us. The ability of government to innovate and to be, keep, to be creative is key to building resilience. He emphasized that government should set the example, providing the direction and the impetus for innovation to prosper and to meet the demands of the new normal. 
A key message that has been emphasized through the four webinar series is the importance of building trust. Trust is an important element of governance innovation. Without trust, the implementation of reforms to address risks and uncertainties will lead to inequalities and punitive actions. And how do we build trust? We learned from the Thailand's government governance responses to COVID-19 that trust can be built through transparency and continuous updates of information that is based on informed, evidence-based health situation, treat, treatment guidelines, and policy decisions. Community engagement can be established through online education and periodic citizen surveys to ensure uh, adherence to government interventions and enable pub the public to distinguish true statements from false news. Jan McDonald from the Center of International Governance Innovation also mentioned the importance of building trust in technologies. There are commercial and criminal abuses of technologies. There are governments accused of deploying technologies to target political opponents. And these situations can cause significant damage to public trust. And in the worst case scenario, the people who are afraid of or resistant to public institutions and to governance reforms are likely to remain. Data privacy rights and integrity of digital innovation infrastructure should be protected. How can this be done? From the global experience and from BSP's own implementation of FinTech, what we, what we note is that technology innovation needs to be supported by standards and regulations based on informed experimentation. Public institutions should also learn to navigate through the politicization of, of science because this has tremendous uh, public cost. The conference has also underscored on the whole of government approach, whole of society approach. We all commonly hear this, and the bureaucracy should develop, this means that the bureaucracy should develop the mindset of thinking horizontally rather than vertically. Mr. James Bromby of the World Bank, for instance, spoke about how the pandemic has made us realize that dependence on the center of government can be disastrous in the face of complexities and limited resources. We need coordinated action within government and with civil society for the state to use its resources effectively. For those who are interested to know of the theory of uh, behind this coordination and collaboration, you could uh, look up on the uh, theory of co-production, which was popularized by the late um, economist Eleanor Ostrom. It is also important to note that a key ingredient to collaboration and coordinated approach is trust. High trust societies are socially co cohesive societies. Innovation in public governance also requires shift to tech-powered new normal. It's a term used by Dr. Aoki. And when we talk of new normal, this is not only about the current pandemic, but to extensive use of technologies to build resilience. The traditional mindset, especially in countries with significant digital divide, is that it is not fair since technology tends to widen inequalities in societies. However, we should just do it. This is not a reason for not modernizing. We can address the digital divide, aside from uh, improving our infrastructure, by also being mindful of design thinking and user orientation. The deployment of technology can be te tested to ensure that it works and solves the intended problem. And programs to care for the digitally challenged can also be put in place. Another key lesson from this conference is that, the is that innovating governance and institutional reforms have to be based on informed decisions. Poor government performance has often been associated with problems of data and information scarcity, as 
voted by our uh, speakers for today. However, the tech-powered new normal has reduced the cost in information gathering and can break down asymmetries in information as presented to us by Ms. Stephanie of Thinking Machines and Dr. Lagmai of the UP Resilience Institute. More and more, we will be relying on non-traditional sources of data and machine learning. The possibilities of data capture, improved data accuracy, and model building are immense. So in the future, I hope that we are able to apply the learnings from this conference and from our experiences to, to innovate and be able to respond to the issues based on our common objective to improve public govern sector governance in the country. And before I end, let me uh, express our final thank you to our uh, uh, ABPC conference speakers and panelists. Thank you for your presence and for the interesting and useful presentations. We are also thankful to the webinar, uh, to our webinar moderators for professionally handling the discussions, to our civil uh, to our co-civil servants in government, the business sector, academe, civil society, and the international community, thank you for being with us, for joining us, and for your active participation. And I also wish to thank our own staff for making this event possible. As mentioned, to our PIDS scientific uh, team composed of our research fellows, Dr. Tabuga, Dr. Sikat, Dr. Dubingo, and Dr. Ulep for taking the lead in identifying the conference theme and in framing the topics for the webinars. The PIDS Research and Information Department, led by uh, Dr. Sheila Shar, for the excellent management of the events. Our Research Services Department, the ICT Services Division, and Administrative and Finance Department for technical and administrative support and for ensuring that our conference platforms run smoothly. To the ABPC Secretariat Office, handled by Josie Alam. Almeda, Nina, Nina Asis, and Gino Chan, thank you for the efficient supervision, the conference speakers, panelists, and the APPC conference program. Maraming salamat. I wish everyone a blessed day, and we hope to see you again in future APPC events. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pat. Now, before we uh, finally uh, close our uh, session, uh, just a few reminders. Um, okay, so for those of you who are interested in um, getting a copy of all the presentations that were made um, during uh, this APPC webinar series, including our kickoff um, a forum for the Development Policy Research Month, you can access them uh, from um, our uh, website, the PIDS website, as well as a DPRM subsite. And also, please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. If you miss it, we will e email you the link after the event. And please also regularly visit our uh, website and our social media pages. For our forthcoming events, uh, flash on the screen are our events uh, for October, uh, this coming October. So we have one on October 8th, that's uh, poverty, the middle class, and income distribution. Distribution. This is a PIDS study uh, penned by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jose Ramon Albert. And then on October 15, we will uh, have another webinar on uh, the results of a uh, another PIDS study uh, com uh, commissioned by the IDRC, International Development uh, um, Research Center on uh, the weather and, inform weather and Climate Information Needs of Small Farmers. This study was uh, uh, done by uh, Dr. Sonny Dubingo and, and, uh, her colleague, and his colleagues. And then finally, in October 22, we have um, a webinar on the results of the uh, process evaluation of the performance-based bonus scheme, which was made, that um, the evaluation was made by Dr. Jose Ramon Albert and consultants, namely uh, Dr. Uh, Ronald uh, Mendoza, uh, Dr. Gina Openiano, uh, Dr. Jennifer Monhe, and Mr. Uh, Michael Pastor. So we hope you could join us again in this webinars this 
October. Okay, and finally, we would like to thank, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academia, uh, civil society and this business and international development community who join us today and you can see the names of these offices on the screen. So friends, this concludes our uh, annual public policy conference webinar series um, for this year. So thank you very much for being a part of our development policy research month celebration this year. Enjoy the rest of your day and always stay safe and healthy. Maraming salamat po and see you in October.